so good evening everyone it's my pleasure to introduce lenny kosal to you all he is a silver level guide from masai mara kenya today he'll talk about the lake nakuru and samburu parks in kenya and towards the end uh, you can ask questions or you can chat uh, in the booking box okay thank you once again uh, lenny you can start now okay you can share the so, screen yeah so thank you everyone I'm uh, speaking to you from uh, uh, Kenya. Masai Mara is actually where my territory is, and I welcome you all to this session. Uh, uh, my name's real name is Lenny Koshal. I'm a Silver Guide level and a Kenya Professional Safari Guides Association. And I came up with this idea of sharing information about this country called Kenya as one of the best tourist destination in East Africa. So it is my greatest pleasure uh, to welcome you all and to thank you for joining. So we had the first session about Amboseli National Park uh, that we did uh, last week. And today we are going to talk about Lake Nakuru and also Samburu National Reserve. So all this, as you know, uh, it's now a very hard time for us as guides or also as tour operators all over the world because of this pandemic. But I'm very, very glad that I can be able to meet all of you here, though we are very, very far away from each other. But I'm going to take you a game drive through uh, those uh, two parks. So we are starting with Lake Nakuru National Park, whereby it is a park that is 164 kilometers away from Nairobi, which is the capital city of Kenya. So people can actually arrive uh, in the airport, maybe in the morning or even in the afternoon, and definitely they can be able to go to Lake Nakuru National Park because it's not far from the central point of guests or tourists that we get in the country, which is the Jomo Kenyatta International Airport in Nairobi. Then also the place, uh, as you can see, the name is uh, Nakuru. It is actually a Maasai name meaning dust. In Maasai, we call it Orkororo. That is what it means. Uh, it is actually means dust or a pool of dust without water or anything. So many years back, the lake had very, very small water and the rest of the place was just dust. So that is what the Maasai people call Orgororo. But the other people, because they don't know how to pronounce, they call it Nakuru, but the real name is Orgororo. Then the park is actually 188 uh, square kilometers, a very, very small park and around 60-70% uh, of it is covered by water. So what happened, people go through uh, to do game drive just around the lake for game viewing. And uh, we have some accommodations. We have some accommodations in the lake. Uh, that is uh, Sarova Lion Hill. Uh, that is one of the picture of the room. We also have Lake Nakuru Lodge. We also have very, very good view whereby you can be able to view the whole lake while you are in the camp. Then also, this is one of the camp called Gweha Camp. It is outside the park, but just in the animal corridor, small conservancy called uh, Soizambu Conservancy. So it is found in that area. So all these places, I'm showing you that it is just places right. where photographers uh, photographers can mostly stay, for example, inside the park because it is very convenient for them to go very early in the morning and uh, get some pictures maybe of birds or wildlife uh, while they are inside the park. But also this camp called Bweha, it's outside the camp. Families can go there because it is not far. It's only like a 20 to 30 minutes, uh, 15 to 20 minutes drive from the camp to the park. So this is uh, now how the 
the park looked like. The picture was actually, I took it at a place called Baboon Cliff. Baboon Cliff is found in the western side of the park. And actually, you can be able to view the wall park. And most of the time, when we used to have flamingos in the area, where you can see my mouse is, is actually one of the places where flamingos can be able to be seen because they like to be on the lake uh, shores. Then also the park was actually established in 1961 as a national park in Kenya. Then we have uh, this giraffe, it is called the Rothschild giraffe. It is one of the attractions that are in this place. Uh, whereby it is one of the endangered species of the three species of giraffe we have in East Africa. So we have Maasai, we have uh, reticulated, this one is called Rothschild. So I will take you through the three species uh, later as we continue. So these species actually were introduced in this park back in 1977 uh, because they used to be found uh, mostly, uh, I mean, introduced to the park in 1977 because the population, the small population we have are actually found in the western part of Kenya to Uganda. So uh, a lot of them were actually killed by meat, And also, so the big population we have actually were introduced from the neighboring country, uh, Uganda, to Kenya back in 1977. Then we still have the same species in Nairobi, a place called Giraffe Center. They actually took them there to try to multiply the number of the species uh, because it is one of the endangered species and for sure we don't want to lose all of them to be uh, extinct. And then uh, we also have the black rhinos and also that is the eastern black rhino. And then we also have the uh, southern white rhino. I will go through uh, these uh, rhinos later today uh, because I will discuss to you about, uh, about the rhino and the buffalo as two of the big five that we have in Lake Nakuru National Park. Uh, since we did elephant in Amboseli, for those who attended the session of Amboseli National Park, we did about the elephant. Then when we reach Samburu, I will tell you about the leopard. As one, as one of the other big five. Then the next session, that is maybe next week, I will tell you about the lion, which is actually another uh, uh, member of the big five. Then uh, that is uh, buffalo. So in this place, the park is actually uh, famous. It used to be famous because of flamingos whereby they are they used to be in the lake in millions. So uh, this place, the lake is found in the Great Rift Valley, whereby uh, it has an alkaline water, the water is salty. So that's why you find uh, the blue green algae, which is the food for this flamingo, can actually be able to grow in this area because mostly or 100% it grow in places with high pH uh, of salt that is around seven percent and uh, maybe six to seven percent is actually places where this blue green algae can grow but uh in 2013 the water level in this lake has actually increased uh, this is because of uh, rain water because the lake has some inlet water actually there is a lot of rivers that brings water from outside the park, that is from Mao Forest or Abadea Ranges to this lake. And actually the water level increased. And in that reason, when the water level increased, uh, the concentration of salt in the water actually reduced. So when the pH reduced to go to four to 5%, so that is actually the reason why <coughs> these flamingos had to move to those other lakes. It is because the food is not growing anymore because the water level that have rose up or have increased has actually dissolved the water pH and actually it took it down and this food cannot be able uh, to grow. Then also in the place, uh, we have some uh, lot of birds like the fish eagles. We have the pelicans as you can see. And then also we have some fish 
this is uh, mostly, I can say it's a very, very common fish in the area. It is called the Graham's uh, silchid fish or like Magadi tilapia. It is actually a kind of fish that was introduced in these lakes uh, back in 1960. Uh, that is actually, this kind of fish can uh, mostly survive in this very, very salty area uh, lakes. So this is actually the kind of fish that uh, fish eagle eat in the area and also uh, the pelicans because uh, sometimes the pelicans can actually be able to eat a lot of fish so that they can use them as food, not like the flamingo, whereby they can eat that microorganism or organ, organism called the blue algae because you cannot be able to see in your uh, naked eyes. Then also we have some other birds in the area because we have actually around 400 uh, species of birds. Uh, as you can see, uh, these are three species of birds. The big one with the mouse is called the marabustock. Then also the small white one are called uh, the kettle egret. Then also we have this other one between the two marabustock. It is called the sacred ibis. So these birds are actually, they were feeding on the carcass of a buffalo. So they are scavengers. But most of the time you find the cattle egret follow the herbivores, so that when the herbivores disturb the grass, they take advantage and feed on the small insects that come out of the grass. That is the grasshoppers and all that. So it's actually a kind of relationship called uh, commensalism whereby no uh, individual that is uh, harming each other for them to feed. So the, the bird is actually uh, depend on the happy force indirectly. Then we also have uh, the guinea fall. This is called the helmeted guinea fall. As you can see in the head, it has something like a helmet. So that is where the name come from. They call it helmeted guinea fall. But actually we have three species of these uh, uh, of guinea falls in East Africa. Uh, this one, the helmeted one. We also have the fulturing guinea fall that I will show you when we go to Samburu very, very soon. Uh, then we also have the crested guinea fall that are mostly found in the mountains. Uh, for example, if you go to places like Mount Kenya for bird watching, you can actually be able to see that kind of a bird. Then we also have the woolly neck stock. The woolly neck stock, the also given the name because of the neck, it looks like a wool. So they call it the woolly neck uh, stock. They are also found in the area. We also have the Ruppel's long tail starling. This is one of the starling that is found in the place, but we also have the superb starling. They are found in the area and so many other starlings. So it's just some of the birds that we have that I'm showing you pictures. I cannot be able to show you all of them because it will take us forever. It's a lot of birds. 400 species of birds is uh, so many. Then we have the blacksmith lapwing. Blacksmith lapwing are also very, very common in the Lake Nakuru National Park. And then we have the sandalbill stock. Sandalbill stock. They are also very, very common in the area. Uh, you can also be able to photograph them uh, when you visit the place. They are very common. Then we also have these other two birds. The one on the corner, on the left side, it is called the yellow bill uh, duck. They're also found in the area. You also have the gray-headed gull. You can also be able to photograph them uh, in the place. That is like Nakuru. Then we have the National Bird of Kenya. This one we call the National Bird of Kenya because it is a bird that you can actually be able to see in all parks that we have in Kenya, apart from uh, sometimes the, in the mountains. But in all other parks, actually, you can be able to, to get them. I can say uh, maybe 90% of the parks we have in Kenya, you can be able to see the lilac, breasted roller, lilac breasted roller. Then we have the African hoopoe. African hoopoe, you can also find them in like Nakuru National Park. It's one of the very, very common bird. And then uh, 
We also have uh, the pelican. I've shown you the pelican earlier. So you can also be able uh, to see them uh, in the place. Then we also have some other small animals. Uh, that is uh, the hyrax. Well, in the place that I took the picture of the Oleg uh, in Baboon Cliff, you can actually be able to see a lot of hyrax. That is a rock hyrax. And actually, they are very, very uh, important animals. Uh, they have a lot of uh, uh, characteristic, similar characteristics or a lot of uh, similarities with the elephants, whereby they have some small teeth that look uh, like a tusk. There are small canines of them. They also have a very long gestation period of around seven months. And there's no uh, an elephant is one of the mammal that actually have a very, very long gestation period of 22 months. So this small animal can actually go up to seven months. Also, the way joints, uh, the bones were placed to each other, just like the elephant. Similarities, the leopards. The leopards are found in the area, but they are not 100% common to be seen. When you see one, it's a golden opportunity when you see one, but we have them there. We also have the lions. They are found in the area. <clears throat> and most of the time for the lion, you find they are tree climbing lions. So the reason why they are tree climbing lions, it is because the park is very small. And actually what happened, these lions, uh, uh, the, the, the percentage or the population of buffaloes is very, very high. So the only way these lions can be able to protect themselves from being attacked by the, by the buffaloes is to climb on trees for security purposes. And another reason is, uh, in places, for example, like Masai Mara, you can also find lion climbing trees. Uh, and this is actually not because of the buffaloes, it is because of the flies. So when there is a lot of flies in the area, the lions climb on the trees uh, to try to protect or to prevent themselves or to get themselves away from the flies. But in that case, uh, like Nakuru, it's because of the danger of being attacked by the big number of uh, buffaloes, whereby they attack lions in a mob. And then, when now we come back to the giraffe, these are the three species of giraffe we have in Kenya. The one on the left side is called the Rothschild giraffe, whereby uh, the one on the middle, it is called the the Maasai giraffe. And then this, the other one on the right, it is called the reticulated giraffe. So the Rothschild giraffe are mostly found in Lake Nakuru National Park, where we are now for game drive. And actually, uh, when you try to look at their skin, they actually have, uh, the, the, when you get closer to them, the, the skin, the, the, the fur, of the, this giraffe is actually much bigger. It's not very, very smooth like this other giraffe. Then also you can uh, be able to see the pattern, the patterns of the, the spots. It's much different from this other one. Uh, it has some small shape whereby they are a bit sharp on some sides, not all sides. You can see it has some sharp ends that is actually the main way you can uh, be able to differentiate it. And also you can see they are orange with uh, some small brown patches. So that is uh, the only way you can only use the pattern to differentiate this giraffe. Then in the middle, that is the Maasai giraffe. You can actually see they have what is called rosetted kind of uh, spots. They are like flowers. The spots doesn't have any regular shape. They are like flowers. Then for the reticulated giraffe, you see the spots have some regular shape and there is a pure white line that actually separates uh, the spots from each other. Then uh, when you go back to this uh, Rothschild giraffe, 
you see the spots end before the knee and they have like white socks. So that is another way you can actually be able to differentiate uh, from the others. Uh, so when it comes to size, uh, the Maasai giraffe is always the tallest of all the giraffe. Then the reticulated giraffe, the ones that are found in the northern part of Kenya, are large. They are a bit huge compared to the other two. And uh, the Rothschild giraffe are in the middle. So the giraffe can actually live 26 to 28 years. And also they have a gestation period of around uh, uh, 15 months, uh, 14, 15 months. But actually, what happened to the giraffe when they are, give, they are almost giving birth, they can be able to change. When, for example, there is a natural calamity that is coming, the giraffe can be able to detect and give birth uh, some months before or after. So they can actually be able to vary the date or the month that they are giving birth depending on the things that are coming that they can be able to, to detect something is coming. So uh, that is actually how long the gestation uh, period is. Then also, uh, these guys are very, very strong. One kick of a giraffe can actually kill a fully grown up lion completely because they actually kick uh, mostly in front legs, like to step on it and uh, they can crush the bones or inner parts uh, organs of the, of the lion. So they are very, very dangerous animals and actually they can be able to run uh, very, very fast. Then now, today, because we are going to discuss the rhino as one of the big five, I'm actually going to, what you can see on the screen is the black rhino and the white rhino. So these names, if I start there, are not actually like 100% the real name for these animals. Uh, the researchers actually gave these animals so that people can be able to differentiate them in a very, very easy way. Because these black rhinos are actually supposed to be called the hooked lip rhino. Hooked lip rhino. As you can see, the upper lip is, uh, it is sharp. Then for the white rhino, they are actually supposed to be called wide, wide rhino because of the wide mouth. So uh, that is actually difference number one between the two. The mouth, this one has the pointed upper lip, and this one has a wide mouth. And there is a reason for that. The black rhinos are pure browsers. They feed on the leaves on the trees. So this upper lip can actually help them to, to take the smallest part of the, the smallest leaves in the bush uh, and grab them and eat. And uh, this uh, white rhino, they can actually use the white mouth to eat the grass because they are pure uh, grazers. So there is actually the reason for each and every characteristics of uh, which animal have. Then another way to differentiate the two is the back. If you can see my mouse, you see the black rhino, they actually have a concave back, a concave back. That is actually one of the major characteristic, physical characteristics as a guide that I can use to differentiate the two species at a distance. Because you can actually be able to take your binocular and see the shape of the back. If it is concave, then it is the black rhino. If it is convex, as you can see on the right-hand side, this is a convex back of the white rhino. They have like a hip at the back. So that is actually another way. That is, uh, you can use the back to differentiate the two species, mostly if the animals, the rhinos are standing up. Then the body size is also different. The black rhino or the hook lip rhino is actually smaller than uh, the white rhino. Uh, this is because uh, the fully grown up weigh uh, between 1,000 to 1,500 kgs or 1.5 tons. That is the weight of the hook lip rhino. Then for the white rhino, 
they actually were between 2,000 to 2,300 pages or 2.3 tons for the fully, fully grown up one. Then also the gestation period for the two, uh, it's a bit different, but not very much because the black rhino uh, gestation period uh, can actually be between uh, 14, 15 months. That is the gestation period. And then for the white rhino can be between 16 to 17 months. So uh, that is uh, another difference for the two. Then another thing is when you see, when it comes to social behavior for these rhinos, the black rhino are always aggressive. And that's why sometimes when we are on game drive, when you try to get closer to them, or even when they see the car, they start like running or getting agitated. Unlike the white rhino whereby they are very, very social. And uh, when they see the cars, they don't like run away. And uh, in that reason, the black rhino, when they have uh, young ones, that is the calf, when they are in danger, the calf always lag behind the mother when they are running out of danger. And for the white rhino, the calf is always in front of the mother when they are running away from danger. So that is actually another way you can be able to differentiate. When you see them, like you come and see them, you can actually be able to use the reaction, the immediate reaction of the rhino to know which one is this, is it black or white rhino? Because the black are very, very aggressive. They can even put up their tail and be like they want to run away. And another thing, because the black rhinos are pure browsers, when they walk, they always walk as their head is moving up or is facing up because they are used to the mode of feeding that is browsing. So when they browse, the head is always facing up. So when they move, it is uh, the same thing. The head is always up, not down, like the white rhino because they're used to the mode of feeding that is grazing. So when they walk, their head is always uh, facing down. Then another thing is uh, uh, the, the, when the rhino communicate, they also communicate like human being or like any other animal in the wild uh, by actually using a scent. They can use scent for communication, whereby sometimes you find the rhino for example, uh, urinating on a place or even uh, putting dung in a place whereby most of the time when they drop the dung, they always try to scrap it or to, to cover it or to make sure they dismantle so that the other rhino that come cannot actually be able to get the scent of uh, what has happened there. If, for example, it's a female that does that, when another male comes, they can actually be able to detect or to know if that female is actually in, is in oestras. That is, a, that is our way of communication because the female can urinate in a place or even put the dung, and definitely when they remove the dung, there are small urine that come. So the male will always follow the female and tries to sniff it, after sniffing and realize, yes, the female is in oestras, they always try to scrub the dung, and then also they pee or spray on it, so that if there is another male coming, he cannot actually be able to trace the scent or to know that there is a female that is in oestras. So that male actually have to make sure that uh, they uh, they destroy that uh, smell or that scent from another male. Then also uh, another thing of communication is about uh, urination for the rhinos. The rhinos actually can use uh, the urine of other rhinos to determine things like the age, if the rhino that urinate in that place is young or older. 
they can also be able to determine the sex if the one that spray on the place is a male or a female, and then also they can use to for ID for identification. If it is one of their member in the same territory, though rhinos are not very territorial, but actually they can be able to know each and every one that live in their ranges, so they can use the urine to determine who did uh, that urination. They can actually be able uh, to tell what happened in the place. Then uh, we also have uh, the skin of these rhinos. You can actually see they have wallowed themselves on the map. This is actually to prevent sunburn and also to prevent uh, insect bite. So the skin of the rhino is very, very thick. And actually that helps them to prevent themselves from uh, thorn bushes when they are going through the bushes uh, for feeding. And also it prevents the ticks. But mostly when you see them wallowing themselves on the mud, they can, this mud, when it gets dry, it actually helps them to remove the tick or any other insect that is stiff in their uh, skin. When the mud fall off, it will fall with everything. Then also you see some birds on the top of this black rhino, those are the red big ox peckers. They actually do a, what is called a symbiotic benefit because both parties are benefiting. The rhino is benefiting and the bird is also benefiting. This is because these ox peckers, they eat the ticks. And when they eat the ticks, the, the rhino cannot be able to get diseases that are actually transmitted by those parasites called ticks. Also, there is a uh, dantrax in their skin. They can actually be able to eat or clean uh, the rhino. So that is a symbiotic uh, benefit. Then another thing about the rhino is the, the eyesight is very, very poor. They have very, very poor eyesight, but they have very, very good sense of smell. And also they have very good hearing. And actually, most of the time when we are on game drive or when I am on game drive, I can actually be able to realize uh, the ears of the rhino can actually be able to rotate uh, many directions when they want to hear. If you make some unnecessary noise, for example, if you make unnecessary noise, you can actually realize they stop eating and they put their ears immediately to roll any direction that actually they can be able to hear or feel there is noise coming from. So they have a very, very flexible muscle that can actually be able to give them or to give the ear to rotate in different direction. Then also there is another difference that I almost forgot to tell you about the rhinos, is the size of the ears. The black rhino has smaller, smaller ears compared to white rhino. And for this white rhino, uh, we have another species in Kenya, in a place called Olpegeta Conservancy. And this conservancy is actually one and the only place in the whole world you can be able to get the northern white rhino. Northern white rhino, we only have two in the whole world that have remained, and they are found in a place called Olpegeta Conservancy. And in this case, they are very, very similar to southern white rhino, but they have very, very slight difference. That is on the ears, whereby the northern, the northern white rhino, actually the ring, the ring of the ears, if you can see my mouse, the ring of the ears is hairy, very hairy. So that is the major way that you can use, or the easiest way you can be able to use to differentiate these two species. That is the northern white rhino and the southern white rhino. Then another thing is uh, uh, these rhino are actually uh, in the territory where the female can actually be able to move or cover very big, very big range, ranges when they have calves. When the rhinos have calves, they are always restless. 
so they can actually be able to cover very very large areas compared to male rhinos so that is uh, all i can tell you about the rhino today and actually if there will be questions after the end feel free to ask so i'm actually uh, going to give you uh, another big five information of another big five that is the african cape buffalo so they are called the cape buffalo uh, because of the male the male is actually the one that brought the name because when they are fully grown as you can see in my picture on the left hand side uh, this male have very very massive uh, horns and when they they are fully grown because they live up to 26 years so when they are 18 years and above this small space between the horns can actually be able to fill up sometime and form something like a cape so that one we call the boss this place of the buffalo we call the boss we don't keep the we don't call the cape by then but we call the boss so females as you can see on the right hand side picture they don't have uh, that kind of formation in their horns so that is uh, actually the major way that you can use to differentiate between the male and the female and actually you can also use the body size whereby uh, the male is very very much masculine as you can see in the picture they have very very strong uh, neck it is for muscles that that is actually what happened to most of the uh, living things uh, that is in mammals most of them the male are always more masculine than female and then uh, because the male can actually weigh between 700 to 1000 kilograms and the female can weigh between 500 to 700 kgs so uh, that is a major way that you can use to differentiate uh, those ones and these buffaloes actually find themselves in the list of the big five not because they have i-40 that people can kill them to take for market but they are the most dangerous of the big five they are more dangerous than elephant they are more dangerous than lions they are more dangerous than a leopard and they are more dangerous than rhinos not only to human being because they kill over 200 people every year that is buffaloes but they are also dangerous to other wild animals for example the lions the lions uh, they know they are the king of jungle we call them king of jungle but they don't call themselves king of jungle when the buffalo are there and that's it. that is why actually uh, the lions in Lake Nakuru National Park climb trees because of the danger they get uh, from buffaloes so uh, they actually uh, they are found almost all over in Kenya you can actually find them in all parks that you visit uh, because they are very 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 common and actually uh, when they, they call, because they also communicate, they just call like cows. Whoa. That is the sound they make when they call. So you can hear and you say it is a cow, no, it's a buffalo. So uh, that is also the small information I can give you about the buffalo. And I will wait if there will be any question that you will ask about uh, the buffaloes or whatever we have already uh, discussed so another thing is uh i'm going to share with you about uh, uh samburu national reserve but before samburu national reserve uh, so now we go to samburu national reserve which is our second uh topic of the day uh, whereby you can actually it is actually 350 kilometers away from the city of Nairobi 
where most of our safari starts in Kenya because of the main airport that is Jomo Kenyatta International Airport. But at the same time, you can go from Lake Nakuru National Park to Samburu National Reserve. You can live in the morning and definitely you will arrive in the place uh, for lunch. So uh, this Samburu National Reserve, uh, it is actually found in the northern part of Kenya. It's found in the northern part of Kenya. And uh, I would like to share uh, the map, the map of the place, so that you can actually be able to see uh, the park, that is the, the map of the park. So I don't know if you can uh, think, yes, you can be able to see my screen. That is the map of Samburu National Reserve. And also we have another part called Buffalo Spring National Reserve. I'm actually using my website, my company's website, to show you the map of the place. So that is how big the place is. So back in 1948, uh, that is when all this park was established as Samburu National Reserve. But back then in 1985, the two park, that is uh, uh, the community of Isiolo, the Isiolo County and Samburu County together and say, let us separate this park to be two. And then, uh, there is this river, you can see, it is called a Wasongiro River. It is now at the boundary of the two park. Uh, so the one on the left side, where the, my mouse is, is Samburu National Reserve, which covers an area of 165 square kilometer. And then the Buffalo Spring site actually covers 131 square kilometer. So there is no any difference between those two parks because the animals are the same. They freely move from one place to another. So the only small difference we have is the vegetation of the area, whereby uh, in the Buffalo Spring site, it's uh, more savanna. There are some more open area compared to Samburu National Reserve, but the animals are the same. Then, uh, when we go there, we also have some accommodations in the place. Uh, we have Ashimil Samburu Lodge. It is found in the Buffalo Spring site. Then we have Sarofa Shaba. There is another small reserve called Shaba National Reserve. It is found in the eastern side of both Samburu and Buffalo Spring National Reserve. That is where Sarofa is found. Then we have the reserve. Then we have elephant bedroom. Elephant bedroom is also found in a uh, Samburu uh, National Reserve site. So when you look at this map, you can actually be able to see all these lodges. This is Sarofa Shaba. So it is in the west eastern side of the parks. Uh, that is where Shaba National Reserve is. And it is also a very, very important park. I will tell you later why. We have some species of birds that are endemic to the area, and you can actually find them in the Shaba National Reserve more compared to Samburu and Buffalo Spring. Then uh, this is uh, Samburu Sopa Lodge. See, it is found almost in the eastern side of the park, western side. And then Samburu Ashinil, it is actually on this side of uh, Buffalo Spring. Then this is Elephant Bedroom. So these are some of the parks that are for, of uh, accommodation. To this one. So, this is actually the place, or this is the time uh, where uh, that book was uh, written. Then uh, also, we have uh, we have um, just a minute. 
we have we have the Buffalo Springs National Reserve. That is the neighboring uh, reserve of Samburu, of which we have to discuss them because there used to be one park, as I told you earlier, and they were established in 1948 and later separated in 1985. So Buffalo Spring is actually the name that come from the spring that is found inside this reserve. This uh, spring actually was formed during the Second World War. When the British Army were camping in the place, at the same time, there were some uh, Italian army that were in the northern side towards Ethiopia. So there was a battle or a fight between these two army, the British and the Italian army. So they throw the bomb to the Brit that is the Italian to the British, and actually the bomb, the blast, the bomb blast formed that spring. That spring now is a very, very important one to that part because when Erifa Wasongiro dries, that is the only place all these animals can be able to get fresh water, which they can drink during a uh, dry season. We have a lot of other swamps whereby they can, animals can actually be able to get water, but sometimes they might end up drying in very, very long dry spells. But this buffalo spring cannot be able uh, to dry. So uh, this is actually a picture that was taken uh, in the uh, lobby of a uh, elephant bedroom uh, camp. Then uh, this one is the, same elephant bedroom. Then also this one is called um, uh, Intrapid. This is a picture of Intrapid, the camp, safari camp. I've already shown you some pictures. That is the tent. So you can actually, as a family safari or photographer safari, you can be able to get very, very good accommodations in the place. And then uh, this is a chenil. You can actually see behind it is uh, a Wasongiro River. Then, now this park are actually famous because of what we call the special pipe of Samburu. Number one is the Grefi Zebra, you can see on the screen. Then number two is the reticulated giraffe. They are also found in the northern part of Equator. They are one of the special five. Then uh, number three is the Oryx. Oryx are also found in the northern part of Kenya, that is Samburu Buffalo Spring Shaba, as some of the special five. And then also we have the, the Somali ostrich. We have two species of ostrich, that is Maasai and Somali. So the Somali one are found in the northern part of Kenya. And actually, I will tell you how to differentiate between the Maasai and Somali ostrich. Then also we have the Gerenuk or we can call it giraffe neck gazelle. They are also one of the special five of Samburu uh, National Reserve. And then uh, we have the leopards. Actually, this, it is one of the big five that we are going to discuss today in Samburu National Reserve. But before we go to the leopard, I actually want us to start from the the Grefi zebra, which is one of the very, very famous uh, zebra in the northern part. You can actually see they are very, very big. And there are some physical characteristics that you can use to differentiate this Grefi zebra and the common zebra. That is the bushel zebra, the one that are found in Samburu itself. And also it is found in most of the other parts in Kenya, including Mara, Amboseli, Savo National Parks, Nakuru, Samburu, Naivasha, uh, and all that, and Masai Mara. So when you look at the two uh, uh, zebras, you can actually see the pattern of the stripes is very, very different. Number one, the grapefruit zebra on the left-hand side, the patterns are narrow. They are very narrow. And actually, they don't meet anywhere. Therefore, this, uh, this zebra has a white belly. 
and for the common zebra the stripes are broad they are big in size and they meet at the belly so that is physical characteristic number one you can use to differentiate the two number two is the shape and the size of the ears as you can see the gray zebra on the left hand side they have big ears and broad actually they are like curved at the edge at the end they are very large and curved and then the common zebra as you can see from my mouse they have small ears and sharp at the tip form like a v-like shape at the tip then another different is the body size these crafty zebra are big and they look more of a horse for example in that shape and the common zebra are small in size and they look more of a donkey they look more of a donkey another different is uh when you look at uh uh when you look at the the nose though i don't have any picture that can actually show the nose of this one when you look at the nose you see the grey zebra has a white and reddish uh, part in the nose and the, this common zebra they are completely dark in the nose so that is also another physical characteristic that you can use uh, to differentiate the two then the other thing is the two species cannot be able to interbreed because the gestation period is completely different so for example for the grey zebra the gestation period is around uh, uh, it's around uh, 13 months and the common zebra gestation period is around 12 months so you see it's one month different so there is no way they can actually be able to interbreed then another thing is uh, the body weight uh, this uh, grey zebra they weigh between 350 to uh, they actually they are much bigger as per the size so they weigh more compared to the common zebra then also I've already discussed to you about the reticulated giraffe, how to differentiate between the three species we have in the country, and also uh, the, how long they live, 26 years, and the gestation period, which is around 15-16 uh, months. And then also we have the oryx. This oryx, we have two species in the country. We have this one, it is called Besa oryx. Besa oryx are the ones that are found in the north, that is Samburu Shaba and Buffalo Spring. And then when you go to park, like Savo National Park, you can actually be able to find another species of uh, uh, oryx called the fringe eared oryx, whereby the only different, the main main difference is the ears, whereby the fringe eared oryx, they actually have some hair it is hairy at the tip of the ears so that is the main difference or the main way to differentiate uh, the two uh, species and then also now we have the uh, this somali ostrich we have somali ostrich and maasai ostrich and uh, actually the only way you can be able to differentiate them is the color of the neck and the legs whereby somali ostrich has pink uh, has blue bluish legs and the neck and the maasai ostrich has pink pink legs and the neck the body size is the same and for the male they are black in color they are black in color and when you see in this other picture the male is only one here and actually the females are gray in color and you can see there are several female here so uh, one thing about the 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 ostrich is they are polygamous the male ostrich are polygamous they can actually have more than one female 
Another thing is the ostrich are flightless. They cannot be able to fly because of the weight, but they can be able to run up to 72 kilometers per hour. Then another thing is uh, the ostrich egg, uh, they can actually be hatched after they are laid between 40 to 45 days or 42 to 45 days. That is how long incubation period is. And when the ostrich is sitting on the eggs, the two species, that is the two partners, that is the male and the female, can actually be able to sit on the eggs. Uh, and because the female are gray in color, they can actually be able to sit on the eggs during the day to camouflage with the environment to prevent the eggs from predators. Predators are like hyenas, baboons sometimes. We have some eagles that actually can be able to break eggshells and eat the yolk inside or even chick when they are almost uh, catching up. Then sometimes the lions, when they find it, they can break it. Maybe they don't eat, but they just make sure uh, they destroy it. And then the male are actually responsible to sit on the eggs during the night to camouflage with darkness to prevent the eggs from predators. And then uh, another thing about the ostrich is uh, they can actually also be able to communicate. They make some sounds almost if you are not, you don't know uh, about sounds, you can actually confuse with a lion because they make a sound almost similar to a lion. And as for Maasai, we, when we hear the ostrich making that noise, we know it is going to rain very, very soon. So it is at, uh, something like a, a myth for Maasai. It's a belief that when the ostrich makes the sound, it's going to rain. Then also about the eggshell of the ostrich, you can actually boil it in 100 degrees Celsius and it can take up to 40 minutes to boil. So that maybe it is ready uh, for you to eat. And then uh, also the eggshell, the, the yolk, the egg yolk is very, very, very big. It is actually equivalent to 24 eggs of a chicken. So it is very, very big. You can make very big omelet. So, uh, but it's not allowed because like here in Kenya, we are not actually allowed to eat any, anything from wild, apart from the ostriches, whereby we have some farms that keep them and uh, people can enjoy in restaurants like Cardiff restaurant. You can actually be able to eat the ostrich meatballs in the place or even crocodile meatballs. Then when it comes to, when it comes to, this other antelope called the Gerenuk. They are the species that are also found in the northern part of Kenya, whereby they have very, very unique characteristics. These animals are pure browsers. They don't eat grass at all. They only feed on the leaves on the trees. So that's why most of the time, well on game drive, you find this Gerenuk putting up their legs or standing in their front legs to try to reach the, the leaves on the high trees. And another thing about this antelope is no one have ever seen a Gerenuk drinking water. So that is another thing, which means this Gerenuk, they have all characteristics of desert animals or semi-arid animals whereby they can actually apply to adapt the situation in the area. So you find most of these animals, the reticulated giraffe, the, ost uh, the ostrich, yes, the, this gerenuk, the oryx, the, and the zebra, that is the grafy zebra, they have very, very fine skin, very, you, they look like shiny, this is actually, it helps them to reflect away their sun rays to prevent amount of heat 
that is going to their body. And also you find most of the time their nose is always wet. It is always wet. And at the same time you find these animals that are found in the desert, they, as much as some of them, they eat grass, but also they try to eat a lot of trees and shrubs to try to get the juice from the, from the leaves to keep them sustained. Uh, that thirst or to go without water. But no one I've ever seen a Gerenuk uh, drinking water. So, when it comes to other predators, we also have lions, and the lions of Samburu National Reserve are there, and they are, we have very, very big prides, whereby you can actually be able to see them when you visit the place and photograph them. And uh, you find the males sometimes, they don't have very, very big men. The men, for the male, compared to lions of, for example, uh, like Nakuru, Masai Mara, or even sweet waters. And there is a reason for that. The reason is the place is very hot. So these lions, they try to reduce the size of the men to prevent sweating because when they sweat when the place is very hot they can actually be able to attract bacteria and affect their neck so that's why you find they naturally reduce the size of the men in their neck so we also have find the lion we have also have lions there and uh, that is one of the major characteristics you can actually be able to identify from the male lions and also the color of these animals that are found in these places like lions they are the same lions we have in Masai Mara but the color of the body is a bit different because of the environment that they are they actually have to adapt or to change their color so that they can be able to adapt the situation or the the area how the area is. Uh, just like, for example, now, if uh, someone comes from a very, very cold area, you go to a very hot area, your skin actually uh, cannot be able to adapt very quickly until you get used to. So these animals have those kind of characteristics that actually can help them to adapt in that area. So when it comes to the leopard, it is one of the big five that we are actually going to discuss today in Samburu National Reserve because this is one of the places whereby you rarely miss the leopard when you visit the place. So as a guide, I'm always very, very happy when it comes to going to Samburu. Like for example, I have uh, someone that wants to photograph a leopard or anyone that really wants to see uh, the leopard. So first of all, the picture you can see is the very, very famous leopard called uh, Nelowau. It is a very famous leopard. And actually, she's uh, almost the mother of all leopards we have in the Samburu National Reserve. And uh, actually, you see she has a kill on the tree. And so if we start, for example, with the weight, of the leopard, the leopard weigh between 37 to 60 to 70 kgs or, or even up to 80 kgs for the male. And actually they can lift up prey that is twice their weight. For example, when you go places like Masemara, you find a leopard killed uh, a wildebeest and they put them up on the tree. So they are very, very powerful animals and also you can see uh, the joint where the joint is between the joint and the and the paws it is actually very very short and this helps the leopard to gain stamina when they are climbing on the trees uh, to put uh, the prey so the female can weigh between 28 to 60 kgs female are always smaller than male and the leopard, actually, they are not very fast. They can only run up to 60 kilometers per hour and also in a very, very short distance. 
They don't actually go very long distance like uh, hyenas because hyenas are among the uh, the predators that can actually run very, very long distance while running. So when the leopard hunt, normally they stop. They stop while preying or hunting uh, because they cannot be able to hunt, uh, to run very, very long. And then also they have a, a gestation period of around 100 days. That is the, gest the pregnancy period. And they give birth to a litter between two to three calves. And uh, sometimes all of them survive, unless the mother can leave uh, the place that she has given birth to go and search food. Animals like lions, hyenas, can actually come and uh, take or kill the cubs. Even sometimes baboons. The baboons are very, very mean. They can actually be able to, uh, to go to a, an area and find small calves and they make sure they take them away. So, but most of the time you find uh, these leopards, the young ones can actually uh, be able to survive uh, in long time. Then also, for example, in the picture you can see uh, this leopard can actually be able to eat between 3.5, even to four to 4.5 kgs a day when they are eating meat. So that is uh, the average, the average amount of food uh, the leopard can actually eat when they are eating food. Then uh, another thing is uh, when the leopard are actually mating, the leopard actually can be in oestra cycle. It can actually last for 46 days. It can last for 46 days. Westeras is actually a process whereby the female can be on heat. So not really on heat ready for mating, but to produce uh, that kind of uh, uh, that kind of discharge that can actually the other ma the male leopard can be able to smell and uh, uh, they can get ready uh, for mating. But the heat can actually last for six to seven days. That is actually when the leopards are mating. When you find leopard mating, they can actually do it between six to seven days. Then when this leopard give birth, those small cubs, they will actually get born when they don't see. The eyes are completely closed, like the domestic dogs. I know most of you have cubs at home. So they are born uh, when they don't see. But actually, it will take them around uh, four to nine days, and then actually the eyes can be able to open up. Then uh, again, for that cup, it actually take it actually take them uh, three months to be able to follow the mother from one place to another. So the mother, for example, can actually be able to hold on the back, so that if, for example, they are crossing a place or if the cub gets tired, they're really moving very far distant, uh, the mother can carry them, but at three months, that is the time the cub starts to follow the mother. If they are changing uh, in, within their territory, maybe they are changing the place of stay, because sometimes they change uh, because of uh, security uh, purposes. So uh, that is actually uh, what happened. Then, we have another uh, 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 so the leopard also live between 12 to 17 years. That is how long they can live in the wild, but they can even live longer, up to 20 years in captivity. And uh, definitely they have enemies. Their enemies are animal and human beings, whereby they kill them to get the skin and uh, they use them for making some uh, home things and all that for, for trade. And then also uh, we have another animal that is very, very similar to the leopard, that is the cheetah. So I just want to tell you how to differentiate the two so that next time when you're to Kenya, uh, you cannot be able to see 
the leopard and confused with the cheetah. On the screen, that is a cheetah you can see. You can actually see the spots of the cheetah are like dots. They are like dots. And actually, you can see for the leopard, they have like rosetted kind of spots. Once more than one spot is bounded to form one, we call the rosetted kind of spot. Also, you see the leopard are short and masculine. They are short and masculine. And the cheetah are long, tall, and slender. They have a long back, they have long legs, and also they are slender. So the reason why the that is actually flexible and it will help them when they are hunting. It actually help them when they are hunting. And also uh, they are slender so that they can be able to streamline in the air when they are hunting. As you know, the cheetahs are the fastest uh, mammals on earth. They can actually run very fast. They can run up to average 114 kilometers uh, per hour. And also the cheetah, uh, though I don't have, I don't think you can be able to see, they have some tear marks. I didn't put the right picture here. They have some black lines that run from the eyes down to the mouth. This uh, uh, the leopards actually, the cheetahs actually hunt during the day, uh, actually uh, to pre prevent themselves uh, from uh, sun races. So, sorry again about the connection. It is my internet connection. And then uh, now uh, I can say I will finish there today about uh, Samburu and uh, like Nakuru National Park. So I will give time for anyone that have a question. So the field is yours. And th thank you so much for your cooperation. Thank you for your time. And I'm very, very sorry for my connection. Okay, thank you, Lenny. Great. So uh, moving to the question and answer session, uh, I was just uh, following the chat box. Yeah. Uh, Miss Sagarika, are you still online, ma'am? Miss Sagarika? Miss Sagarika had a question. Actually, she has two questions. Yeah. Uh, the first question is uh, about how are the Indian bisons different from the African buffalo? So it's a difficult question for you, Lenny. Uh, probably yes. you have not experienced the Indian bisons uh, yourself. Uh, yeah. So, I, I I I give the question to you. You could you could uh, do the best with that question as uh, you can. Actually, uh, to be honest, I've never seen the Indian bison, so I can actually answer a lot of questions concerning yes. the African animals or African wildlife. So, if I answer that question, I'll be lying to to him. So I have to be very open and uh, very yes. honest to everyone. Saigrika also has a second question. Uh, so her yes. second question is, what is the best season to visit uh, Nakuru and uh, some... So these parks actually, they are not like uh, Masai Mara, whereby some people say we want to see migration. So we are going at this specific time. So I can say for these two parks, you can actually visit any time of the year. You can go any time of the year. Great. Uh, yes. Sagarika, I hope uh, your questions are answered. Would you like to come online? I can see that you're online now. Would you like to ask yes. anything else? And then actually, uh, Paul, before that, yes. I didn't go through the birds. So we also have a lot of bird species. We have some okay. endemic. We have some endemic species that are found in uh, Samburu National Reserve okay. and Shaba. For example, okay. this bird, the bird you can see on the screen is called the Williams Luck. They are actually okay. endemic to that area. We also okay. have this other bird. It is called the Fredsman's Luck. Fredsman's Luck. They are also okay. endemic to the northern part. And then okay. uh, we also have this one called the Mask Luck. Mask Luck. They are also 
endemic to that area. So uh, we also have other around 450 species of uh, this bird, but these three birds, the musk lark, the Fretzman's lark, and the Williams lark are very, very important birds in the area when it comes to bird watchers, because this is one of the places whereby you can actually be able to find them. Mostly, the Shaba National Reserve, the one I told you, they are found in the eastern side of both Samburu and Buffalo Spring National Reserve. Also, we have these birds like the, the Eastern Chanting Goshok. They are very, very common in the area, Eastern Chanting Goshok. And then we have the Folchering Guineafold. Folchering Guineafold. You see, the name actually comes from the, the neck, the neck of this bird. They look like vultures, whereby they don't have the feathers on the neck, but it doesn't do the same characteristic with the vulture, whereby the vulture doesn't have the, the feathers on the neck because uh, it helps them when they are feeding on the bloody thing, so they don't attract, attract bacteria, but it's not the same, we just got the name because they almost look similar to the the vulture, so it's called uh, yellow neck purple. Yellow neck purple, and then we also have the secretary bird. Secretary bird are also there. We have the ring neck dove. They are found in the place. We also have the uh, the hornbills. We have from the decken the yellow bill hornbill, red bill hornbill, and many others. We also have the sparrows. Like this is the red bill uh, buffalo weaver, and this is called uh, uh, it is also a sparrow. This one, it is called uh, the parrot big sparrow. We also have uh, the white headed buffalo weaver bird. We have the white broad, uh, the white broad. Uh, uh, we but for example, this neck it is called the green carpet viper. They are found in the area. Actually, the recent research that was done from those parks up to the northern part of Kenya, they found almost 700 of these necks. So they are found in the area. So, so uh, thank you so much. I know about bird watching because I know we have a lot of bird watchers uh, in the session. Thank you so much. So back to anyone with a question, now they can ask. Yes, Lin. So uh, after, uh, the next question we have is from Mr. Anjita. He also has two questions. The first question is, is mm -hmm. there another species of zebra in the mountain regions in Africa. So you already mentioned about two species today. Yes. Is there any other species specific to the mountains? Uh, we, yes, we have the mountain zebra, but uh, I've not seen them myself. Uh, we have the mountain zebra. Uh, they are also found, but we don't have them in East Africa. We only have the grapey zebra and the common or the bushel zebra here in East Africa. So. Those are the only species that we have. Great. And the second question that Anjita has is about ostriches. His question yes. is, is there any specific period during the year when the ostriches breed? And can we take pictures of the chicks? <laughs> Thank you. So I want to tell you most of the time, the these animals uh, give birth during rain onset or at the end of the rain. So I can tell you uh, during rain onset, this is actually the time you can be able to see all these kind of uh, young ones for from birds and mammals and all that. But they can also give birth or uh, hatch or lay eggs any time of the year. So there is no specific time of the year 
whereby we can say it is an ostrich season. So uh, it actually depends on the luck. And also it depends when you book your safari before you go like some months, you can actually be able to ask the agent those kinds of questions. This is what I want. Is this the best time whereby I can do that? And that agent maybe is a guide or he or she can use this guy to ask, is there something like this happening at the moment in the field? So that is actually how I can be able to answer his question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Mr. Deborlan, and his question is about wild dogs. Can the wild dogs be found in Samburu or Lake Nakuru? 100% Samburu, you can see wild dogs. I can say it's rare to see, but they are found there. They are found there. It depends on your luck. But when it comes to a safari whereby this is the only animal a client want to see, you can actually be able to search them uh, in the northern side of the park and maybe you can be lucky and see them. So they are found there, but we don't have them in like Nakuru National Park. Great, great, great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, that is all the questions uh, we have queued up. We have another question from uh, Mr. Satya, Satya Narayan. Are there any Paul. lodges? Paul. Yes, Paul. yes, doctor. Yeah, there is uh, Rohan wanting to ask a question. Also, Abdul also question. asking regarding owls. Rohan, yes. uh, Rohan, are you online? Answer and ask your question, please. Rohan? Yes, sir. I'm audible. You're audible. Yeah, you're, you're audible. Okay, go ahead. Ask your question. Rohan, we can hear you. Just ask your question. Rohan, please ask your question. Yeah, maybe we can go to another yeah. person when she gets uh, Abdul, uh, Abdullah Al Suwadi. Yes. Abdullah asked, how, are there any owls? And if so, how many species in uh, Kenya? Okay, we have so many species of owls. Uh, we have around uh, more than 10 species, uh, whereby in the place like Nakuru, definitely you can be able to see the Ferrax eagle owl. You can actually also be able to see the spotted eagle owl. We also have the, the, the cape eagle owl can also be able to be seen in the place, but they are not very common. We also have the scoop, the African scoop all, and many others. So definitely you can be able to see so many alls, uh, but mostly if a person or a client is a photographer, he or she can actually be able to take time and search for them because it's not easy to see uh, these kinds of birds. Rohan, uh, Rohan, thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, Rohan, your speech is breaking. So I'll ask the question on uh, Rohan's behalf. The two questions he had about uh, one was about tigers in uh, Lake Nakuru or Samburu. And the second question was whether you can see caracals in uh, Kenya. Yes, we don't have tigers here in Africa. Tigers are found in India. We only have the leopards uh, in Kenya. And then, uh, yes, caracals you can be able to see in most of the parks, but very rare, very rare, very rare to see. It is very rare. Yeah, yeah you can see. Uh, David Waidaka, you had a question when I lost, so maybe you can. Uh... Uh, actually, Lenny, then we were just uh, trying to fill in the, the 
uh, gap because we yeah, lost can you hear me? So, yes, I can hear yeah, you. Can hear me. Oh, thank you so much. No, no, no. I didn't have a question, but basically I wanted to comment what you're doing. Lenny, we worked together at Swano Safaris. I know him very well. Uh, thank you. But it's amazing how technology is taking us to national parks. When you took yeah. us through Nakuru, I was also thinking about Elementaita and all Excellent. the good stuff we have around. And uh, keep up. Thank you're you. doing a good job. Um, we are suffering, like you started saying, COVID has really, you know, um, given us a big blow as professional safari guides in Kenya. Yes. But uh, we are very hopeful that uh, one day we will walk without this thing, yeah? <laughs> exactly. um, it's coming to an yeah. end. Thank you very much, Thank Lenny. you. Thank yes, you so much, Levi. Thank Cheers. you. Cheers. Yeah. Well, Doctor, over to you. Yeah, but that's all. I think the questions are uh, over. There's no more questions uh, remaining. There is one from Ashok Kumar. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is Mr. Ashok online? Yeah, very much. Please, please, Mr. Ashok, uh, you can ask a question to Lenny. Yeah, hi, Lenny. Good evening to you. Good I evening, lived in Kenya evening. for some time and uh, <laughs> been to welcome back. Parts. Thank you. <laughs> I miss it very much. Uh, but, you know, we've always wondered. Everybody spoke of the migration when the, uh, the great herds came from Tanzania into Kenya. And yes, they also yes. went back. There was a reverse migration, which I found was as spectacular. But nobody talks in markets the reverse migration. Why is that? Now, thank you for your question. Actually, the next session, we are actually going to Masai Mara. Because this migration happened between Masai Mara and Serengeti. So hopefully the coming weekend on Saturday, I will be able to talk about Masai Mara as a national reserve. And also I will be able to share all world uh, routes, migratory routes. And also I will share videos of them crossing. And then after that, on Masai Mara, maybe on Facebook, or YouTube live when uh, uh, if that you live. So we are actually that is the next step after this. It's about Masai Mara, but I decide to discuss about the other parks because Masai Mara is actually <laughs> the heart of Kenya. Yeah, thanks. Do include the reverse migration in your talk <laughs> next. I look forward to that. Thanks. Perfect. Karibu sana. I will. <laughs> uh, Mr. Satya Narayana, are you online? You had a question on the lodges. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, Lenny. It was nice. A great presentation. Thank you. Uh, I have not been to Ol Pejeta since you mentioned that, you know, it is between Nakuru and Samburu. Yes. Um, do you suggest that you need to stay in Olpejeta or uh, you, uh, you know, just spend some time between these two parks and visit Olpejeta? 100% I can tell you, you can stay there for two nights for one night, but two nights is good because when okay. you arrive, you can actually do game drive in the afternoon, that is after lunch. Okay. You start okay. with the we have chimpanzees. That is the only place you can see the chimpanzee in Kenya. Then we have, okay. that is uh, the place whereby it's the leading now in the country with the biggest number of black rhinos. And uh, we also have two species of white rhino. That is the northern white rhino and the southern white rhino. And then uh, we also have lions, we have cheetahs, we have leopards. So you can also take the picture of animals with the background of Mount Kenya. Mount Kenya is the second highest summit of Africa. So it is a place I highly recommend. But if you don't have time, you can actually pass by. For example, you are living from Saburu to Nakuru or to Bogoria or to Naivasha or to Elementaita, you can pass by you do game drive, you have lunch at Serena, and then you leave to your next destination. So it actually depends on the period of your holiday if you have time to stay in the place. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Satessa. Thank you.
Uh, that's pretty much with the questions we had in queue. If anybody else would like to pitch in and ask a question, please do that. Hi, Lenny. Anjita here. Yes, Anjita. Welcome. Uh, a small question. Which uh, season is the best uh, to come out there to, for birding? Particularly birding. Forget about this big five or the, the mammals and everything. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, uh, actually, if you want to compile migratory birds and the, the local birds of Kenya, March to April is the best time whereby you can be able to see all these birds. It is also raining season in the area, but you can actually be able to see both migrants like the white stock, for example. Uh, uh, we also have some uh, physical, some shrikes that actually migrate in, in places like Samburu. Uh, you can be able to see so many species of birds at that time of the year. And also remember, when it is raining, it is uh, also time you can be able to see so many birds because they have enough food. That is a lot of plants are uh, having flowers, the nectars and all that. So uh, I can say uh, March, April is good. Wonderful. Um, I'm focused on uh, only on the raptors, uh, oh. like eagle, something <laughs> like that. So yes, then, yes then, then you can come any time of the year. But if you want uh, also to see, for example, like the vultures, uh, 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 feeding uh, in places like Masai Mara, when there is migration, there is always a lot of carcass, uh, those kinds of competition between the vultures and the eagles and the hyenas, uh, for example. So if it is raptors, uh, you can uh, actually also visit uh, some very bad, important area. Uh, that is uh, Nakuru, Samburu, Lake Naivasha, Hell's Gate National Park. Masai Mara is there, Amboseli is there, and uh, Savo National Park. So uh, I can say any time of the year you can be able to get them. Thank you, Lenny. Thank you very much. It's a nice presentation and we are really enjoying it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, too. Okay, any more questions? Shall we wind up? I guess, yes. Uh, we yeah, can, I, we can, I, think, uh, I think we can wind, wind up. Yes. Okay, thank you, Lenny, so, so much. Very good. See you next time thank in Masai Mara. You, thank you. Yes, yes. Very thank soon. you so much, everyone. Thank you so much. We'll meet very soon, Rafiki. Thank yes, you, sir. Yes. Asante sana. Thank you. Lala Salama. That is good night in Swahili. Lala Salama. We say Lala Salama. Lala Salama. Yes, Salama. Yes, Salama. yes, and for, for those who are starting the day, we say Sikunjema. Sikunjema. That is good day. Okay. 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 Thank you. Bye. <laughs>